Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ron Cass. I'm Dean Emeritus of Boston University. I work uh, for my wife at Cass and Associates. She's the Cass, I'm the Associates. Um, and uh, I, let me thank the Federalist Society for organizing today's luncheon and program and uh, recognize uh, Dean Reuter, who is the general counsel and vice president of the society. Uh, Dean assures me he is responsible for nothing today, and uh, the staff assures me that is, is true. Um, <laughs> let me at the outset uh, deny the rumors that Russia has hacked into the uh, Department of Justice and Federal Trade Commission computers and rewritten the merger guidelines. Um, those actually are the way they read. Um, it, was, it, it was translating them from the original German that made them read so smoothly. Uh, we do have a serious uh, subject and a serious program today. Uh, antitrust is a real serious business. It deals with the regulation of business conduct and organization. It is the result of a very thin statutory base and a very rich overlay of both judicial decisions and academic writing. Uh, there is a, an inevitable series of questions when a new administration comes in about what it will be doing. Uh, some of you may have seen the news that the incoming head of the antitrust division was voted out of committee by uh, Senate Judiciary today. Uh, so I think we have at least some inkling of what we're going to start uh, to see. But there's a whole series of questions about how antitrust should function. Should the focus be on the consumer or on business? Should it be on competition or competitors? Should it, it deal with bigness or efficiency? Should it be uh, about economic analysis? Or should it rely on other forms of analysis? If it's economic analysis, what mode of economic analysis should predominate. Uh, when we deal with questions like mergers, well, what should we do with vertical mergers? What should we do with horizontal mergers? What should we do with single firm contact, conduct as opposed to uh, conspiracies among firms? There's a whole series of topics and questions that we have to look at when a new administration comes in to see where its priorities will be for enforcement, what its focus will be, and what its approach to these different topics will be. We have a panel today of experts on all of these subjects. I will give them quick introductions. The introductions will not begin to uh, plumb the depths of their CVs. Let me start with Jeff Manny who is the founder and executive director of the International Center for Law and Economics, a, a, a longtime professor at uh, Lewis and Clark Law School. He uh, did the private practice of law in practicing antitrust law. He clerked for Morris Arnold. Uh, he did a very brief stint uh, at the uh, Federal Trade Commission before they found he was there. Uh, Jeff is a graduate of the University of Chicago Law School. Um, which is a, a, a requirement for being on this panel unless you got a special exemption. Uh, Bert Four is the founder, past president, and now a senior fellow at the American Antitrust Institute. He is a former assistant director of the Bureau of Competition at the Federal Trade Commission. He's the former CEO of an actual real business. Um, we try, uh, in, in my part of the world, uh, in academia, we try to avoid any contact with the real world. Um, Bert did not get the memo. Uh, Bert is also a graduate of the University of Chicago Law School. Um, and since we were classmates, I know just how old he really is. Josh Wright uh, is a professor at the Antonin Scalia Law School. He's the director of its Global Antitrust Institute. He is a former commissioner at the Federal Trade Commission, and I will point out that he, he used that position to leverage himself from a professor at the Scalia Law School to the position of professor at the Scalia Law School. Um, we will talk later about how you, how you ought to be thinking about this. Um, he has uh, his JD and PhD from UCLA, and as I mentioned, the special exemption, 
Uh, when I was doing economics, people said, how do you get to the Department of Economics at UCLA? And the answer was, you go to Chicago and turn right. Um, all of these are uh, serious has-beens, um, but they are also serious scholars in antitrust law. They know a great deal, and each will speak to you briefly before I let them have at each other. With that, Jeff. Thanks, Ron. <laughs> Thanks to the uh, Federal Society and to Dean for having us here. Um, <clears throat> I always like it when, when I've discovered that there are a few other people in the world who are interested in the same things I am. It's very rare. I can't find anyone who will go to Grateful Dead shows with me. Uh, I, uh, I thought that I would talk for just a couple of minutes about um, uh, what I see as a, uh, a couple of the sort of interesting trends or potential trends in, in antitrust right now um, and uh, make a few comments about uh, how one might expect this administration, as opposed to uh, you know uh, an alternate administration, to uh, to address those um, and uh, be sort of short on specifics and leave that for the for the discussion later. Um, to me, the the sort of big story is what I'll, I'll label um, the this uh, resurgence of populist uh, antitrust. That, that's um, something of a misnomer, I guess. Um, uh, I would argue that there's there's very little about it that is um, beneficial to the populace. But uh, uh, the idea is that, uh, as I'm sure people have seen from politicians to commentators to scholars and everything in between, uh, a, a growing and, and increasingly loud <coughs> excuse me, argument that antitrust should incorporate non-economic uh, issues um, uh, that um, that uh, economic power isn't the only thing we should worry about. Um, it's essentially, really at its core, uh, another version of big is bad. Uh, in this case, though, it's bad not just for economic reasons, but for political, cultural. Uh, the word democracy is thrown around a lot. Um, I think there are two particular aspects of this that I, I just want to flag. Um, <clears throat> Uh, sorry, I guess there are three aspects of it. The first one I can dispense with fairly quickly, and that is to say um, we have a, a, a really well-established system of precedent, a pretty strong influence of economics in the, in the U.S. Um, uh, prosecutorial discretion alone will not transform antitrust from uh, where it is today to, to some populist um, nirvana. In the U.S., uh, that's not necessarily true elsewhere, and uh, uh, these—it's not surprising that these sorts of, of issues are arising, um, uh, or I should say, are, are more likely to have an effect in places like Europe, uh, and certainly something that we might want to talk about a little bit because um, uh, America is not, in fact, the only country in the world, and uh, antitrust enforcement is uh, uh, increasingly moving outside the US. Um, so the second issue I want to talk about is uh, this, um, is, is the, um, <clears throat> what I'd lump under the sort of populist, this populist antitrust rhetoric, uh, um, a, a sort of fear of big is bad um, coupled with a kind of fear of technology. Um, so so very frequently the, the kinds of companies that are the object of this sort of uh, the sort of rhetoric are, are, are big tech companies. And, um, it, I, and I think it's not just because they are big. Uh, I think it's also because they do things that people don't particularly understand and uh, that makes it relatively easy, certainly as a rhetorical, as a political rhetorical matter, to make people afraid of, of what they're doing. And, um, uh, and some of these things actually can, even within the confines of, of well-established U.S. antitrust law and economics, uh, potentially be um, uh, accommodated. Um, so, for, for example, uh, to the extent that new technologies <coughs> excuse me, uh, are deemed by some to be anti-democratic in some fashion, they may also uh, be something that can be labeled uh, under some uh, doctrine, or doctrine isn't the right word, some argument like um, uh, anti-competitive product innovation, um, 
uh, or where in which uh, uh, a company can be attacked in part because markets can be narrowly defined enough that, in fact, while a company may not actually have economic power as su sufficient to, to lead to any competitive effects as the antitrust laws see it today, uh, if you define the market small enough, you can always find that, that effect. Um, and so while I don't think uh, we will see a lot of arguments in court that these, that, that in antitrust cases, that companies are are abusing um, uh, our democracy. Um, uh, the effort to try to prevent them from perceived abuses of democracy may play out in the form of antitrust cases um, that could actually be won if markets can be drawn narrowly enough, or or other things that the companies are doing can be uh, can be attacked. Um, I would just draw quick attention to the, the DraftKings FanDuel merger as um, <clears throat> sort of part and parcel of this, not so much on the, on the, the technology aspect of it, but you can't escape the politics of, of that merger, right? I mean, uh, uh, the governments at various levels have been, uh, have been worried about challenging, fretting over the kinds of things that FanDuel and, and uh, DraftKings have been doing for years. Um, uh, conservatives are very concerned about the gambling aspect of it. Um, the folks who run casinos are very concerned about the competition aspect of it. There, there are lots of, of uh, pieces of it that aren't necessarily economic, but that people care very much about. Uh, and there's a, and this is a, just a great example where market definition can be absolutely dispositive. Um, as everyone may know, these companies do, the, do what's called daily fantasy sports. Betting is involved. Um, the government for years has been saying that this is actually gambling. Many states have banned them because, because they don't allow gambling. Uh, and um, uh, now that they're merging, <coughs> excuse me, I'm sure that they would love for the market in which they operate to be deemed to be gambling writ large, in which case they have a tiny market share and there's no concern whatsoever. Uh, if all of a sudden, however, uh, in an effort to stop this, this, this uh, pernicious conduct of Shocked, shocked to find there's gambling online. Um, uh, if instead markets can be drawn narrowly enough and, and, and it can be deemed that there is in fact some sort of a, a daily fantasy sports market, then indeed they have a massive market share and that could prove to be problematic in an in a antitrust case. The point is that th that determination may be strongly influenced by the politics rather than the, uh, than the economics and that will be the mechanism by which that might seep into even our uh, antitrust. Um, I have other things to say, but uh, and I'm happy to keep going. Uh, but but let me know if you want me to um, stop and cover those things later. Uh, actually, I'm not even going to. I'm going to just keep talking for a second because I want to make one other point, <laughs> <coughs> um, which is to say, uh, uh, I think with the change of administration, we should see the typical change uh, in antitrust enforcement that we see when when we see a change in administration from one party to the other, uh, which is to say a fairly marginal change. Uh, typically, the, the difference in, in enforcement under Democratic and, and Republican administrations is not massive, um, again, because we have uh, the courts and uh, uh, to keep things in check. Um, but there certainly are differences at the margin, and that margin it, it isn't necessarily so small, especially if you're one of the companies caught up in it. Um, and uh, <coughs> so I, I guess I should say that it's pretty non-controversial to expect somewhat less uh, in, enforcement on the merger front and, and probably on the um, uh, anti-competitive conduct front as well. But I also think, perhaps more importantly, there's a real opportunity here. Uh, and I hope to see the, both the DOJ and the FTC taking advantage of the opportunity to um, uh, reset perhaps, some of the standards and, and kind of uh, approaches to antitrust. Uh, for example, uh, as everyone may know, at the start of the last administration, the DOJ had, had just adopted the uh, something called the Section 2 report, which took what I would say was, a, was an excellent approach to, uh, uh, to Section 2 uh, enforcement cases, and it was promptly tossed out by the new administration. We could perhaps see this administration re reviving the Section 2 report. It doesn't have any any um, uh, uh, direct effect on on the outcome of any cases or anything, but it does it does influence um, 
the way the uh, enforcers think about uh, antitrust and probably the way courts do, and perhaps more importantly, the way others do internationally. And that's another area in which I'd like to see uh, this administration um, uh, doing more than uh, uh, so, so so taking the time that it might have applied to um, to enforcement actions and using it to try to influence uh, enforcers internationally, as which I pointed out, have not been quite as restrained as uh, as our enforcers have. Um, so now Ron tells me that that it absolutely is time for me to stop, and so I will for now. That Th thank you, Jeff. Uh, I, I also have to say I appreciate you raising the uh, uh, FanDuel uh, merger because as a longtime Washingtonian and fan of the Redskins, uh, I'm deeply into fantasy sports. <laughs> so, uh, Bert? I suspect uh, you're going to think I'm into fantasy antitrust as well. Uh, <laughs> Let me say at the outset that uh, I have to make the usual kinds of disclaimers. I am not speaking for the Federalist Society. I am not speaking for the American Antitrust Institute. I'm just giving you my thoughts. And since um, <clears throat> we started with uh, the topic of populism, I'm going to use that as a, a basic theme, asking uh, at the outset, what do we mean by populism? There's a new book out by a uh, Princeton professor, uh, Jan Werner Mueller, called What is Populism? And <clears throat> he focuses on the common characteristics of populist regimes uh, through history, including uh, modern, <clears throat> modern regimes. And uh, he says, number one, they're always critical of elites. It's the people against the elite. Secondly, the people is a concept, almost Rousseauian uh, general will. Who are the people? Uh, it's not a democratic uh, uh, idea. It is an anti-pluralist idea that only the people who are identified as the people count, and that the uh, charismatic leader is the only authentic voice of the people. Um, Typically, these uh, uh, populist regimes uh, systematically suppress the civil society. And another point that he makes is that uh, policy content is not what it's about. It can be left, it can be right, it can be center. Uh, it's really more a question of attitudes toward pluralism and toward elites. Uh, Neil Averett, uh, a former FTC planner, uh, wrote in FTC Watch recently about populism, defining it this way. Populism is based on the belief that the law has historically been skewed in favor of the wealthy and well-represented. It aims to shift the balance back toward the ordinary person. Um, I think that this focus on redistribution, um, as contrasted to Mueller's, uh, it doesn't work. And it, it doesn't work in my mind because it's hard to be in favor of any political reform that is not redistributional in some sense. Uh, it can be in either direction, but it's going to be redistributional. So the point I want to try to make is that we shouldn't confuse populism, which is a term that most of us would hold as, um, as a, a negative, with what I would call progressive evidence-based reassessment of the role of competition policy. Now, are we entering an era of populist antitrust? Well, it's, you, you could argue that some of the things that uh, candidate Trump said uh, deserve the name populist, but I want to keep the focus on economics. So in terms of economics, what's America first? America first is protectionist on trade, and I think it's uncomfortable with uh, innovation. During the campaign, uh, Mr. Trump talked about Amazon, led by uh, his critic uh, Bezos, as having big antitrust problems. He talked about uh, large media mergers creating too much power. And his meetings with uh, companies that want to merge left the impression that he would approve mergers uh, maybe even outside of the normal processes, 
um, if they come with the promise of more domestic employment. All of this sounds like a possible populist program that could be prone to emotional and politically inspired intervention. But since taking office, uh, President Trump has been too busy with other priorities to talk much about antitrust. His one specific appointment, uh, uh, Macon Del Rahim, does not presage a populist program. Uh, the FTC, on the other hand, is uh, open season because right now I mean, he's, he'll have the potential for recreating the agency uh, in his own image, whatever that means, if he wants to. But uh, given the current standoff with two commissioners uh, who have to uh, agree if anything is going to happen that's going to change, there's no reason to make haste. Uh, meanwhile, we don't know what the budget uh, is actually going to do to antitrust enforcement or to uh, regulatory matters that affect competition in sectoral uh, regulators. Now, Averett's article suggested how a populist antitrust enforcement program might proceed. It's probably not much different from what Jeffrey was saying. Uh, he says it might reject the consumer welfare focus downgrade the importance of efficiencies in merger analysis and vertical restraints, rethink Robinson-Patman Act in, uh, in some respects, uh, not clear what, and perhaps uh, maybe calling for legislation uh, to um, prohibit certain forms of exploitative conduct, which typically would be uh, monopoly uh, abuse of pricing uh, like the EpiPen situation, uh, it would require some legislation. Now, maybe these are a populist program. Uh, I would personally associate myself with a lot of these ideas, but I don't think they're populist. I think that this depends on whether they represent a progressive evidence-based reassessment of the role of antitrust and competition policy in the light of what we know about the world, or whether they come as a kind of blind ideological reaction to a world in which, for various reasons, we no longer feel comfortable. <clears throat> I say it's time to do some reassessment, and uh, I'll do that by making a couple of points starting uh, how did the world look at the time that uh, Ronald Reagan and Bill Baxter took control over uh, antitrust uh, as compared to where we are now. I'll tick off a few. Uh, the drivers of the economy are no longer powerful sellers within defined markets. More important today are networks, platforms, systems, and power buyers. The concentration of business and of wealth has become so high that even the University of Chicago has started to focus on how to address it. And I think this has elements of both market concentration and long forgotten term aggregate concentration within the economy. Big data and privacy are now finding their way into competition policy discourse. I'm not saying we know what to do with them, but they're increasingly being recognized as something that uh, is relevant. My old sector, retailing, it's going through a massive revolution. And along with that is a massive revolution in consumer behavior. Intellectual property itself has gone through uh, a growth spurt leading to new understandings of the relationship between antitrust and intellectual property. And maybe more important, a lot of thinking about the role of innovation and what are the uh, conditions under which innovation is likely to occur. Dynamic economics has become more important than static. And the pace of change itself uh, as Tom Friedman wrote in a, a new book called uh, Thank You for Being Late, the pace of change has picked up dramatically. Economic inequality has become so palpable that this alone can account for much of the populist sentiment that's felt in politics. And people want to know what was the role of antitrust in 
moving toward so much uh, economic disequality? And what, if anything, can antitrust uh, do to uh, change the direction of inequality? Um, economic thinking uh, has expanded from uh, Chicago's focus on consumer welfare and efficiency to consider elements of psychology, institutional behavior, anthropology, political science, management sciences of strategy and marketing. Uh, it's, it's no longer uh, such a tight uh, area of uh, academics. And finally, as Jeff did say, the uh, U.S. is no longer the dominant player in the competition policy world. There is some movement toward harmonization, but a variety of competition policies are likely to persist. Um, I'm going to skip over some points that I wanted to make, and I'm going to finally say this, which I think is an important statement. Um, the, the relationship between dynamic and static economics has to be better understood. The more we emphasize innovation and growth as goals, the more anxiety we create in the society. Dynamic capitalism intentionally, necessarily, creates both winners and losers. And I think we want that. But we can achieve prosperity through innovation only if we also accept the price of a strong safety net to protect the losers and to help get them back onto their feet. And also to reassure those who have jobs that if the economy changes to their detriment, their life is not over. It seems to me that in a dynamic global economy, we're all potential losers. And so those who say that we want free markets and minimal government, I answer, we can't long have free markets unless we also have strong government. The kind of populism which I fear, defined by Mueller, will be the price that we pay for minimal government. I expect there'll be some disagreement on this. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Josh? Where to start? Um, <laughs> you know, if, if so, if you are looking for a, a, a sort of third voice to chime in about the uh, overall value of capitalism or populism versus or what it means, I, I'm not your guy. Um, and you will be sorely disappointed. Um, if you've seen me on a panel, this won't be your first time. So I want to talk about what I think will happen at the agencies in the next four years. Um, and if you want to know what I think about populism or capitalism, you can catch me in the hallway, okay? Um, or buy, buy me a beer. So uh, I think what will happen at the agencies has very little to do with populism. I think what will happen at the agencies has very little to do with what candidate Trump or President Trump has said about Amazon or on Twitter. Just like I thought what the antitrust agencies did, I, I served at the Federal Trade Commission uh, during the Obama administration. Uh, then candidate Obama said a number of things about antitrust. Uh, that I don't think had any influence on what the FTC actually did. The FTC is full of professional staff. There are antitrust lawyers who live there. Uh, there are antitrust economists who live there. Uh, they get up, they think about antitrust every day, uh, they manage their cases, they make recommendations to commissioners, and they vote out the cases in a manner that they view consistent with law. Um, sometimes they disagree. I voted no a bunch. Um, but they do so in, a, in the sort of shadow of existing law and the shadow of existing agency guidelines, which leave room for disagreement. But the zone of that disagreement is informed by what current law is. And the current law says we have a consumer welfare standard in antitrust. Other stuff isn't in there. Maybe you want it in there. Uh, but that's not the analysis that the agencies do. It's not what happened at the Federal Trade Commission, I suspect. It's not what happens at the DOJ. I don't think that is going to change anytime soon. 
the day when the Federal Trade Commission walks into federal court and says, you know what, I know the Supreme Court says it's an economic welfare standard, but let me take a whirl at this thing and just argue this case on non-economic grounds. They, they lose. They lose badly, and nobody wants to do that. So instead, I am going to focus on uh, sort of within those constraints what I think is actually going to happen at the agencies in the next four years. First time I'm going to disappoint you. Um, I don't think things are going to change all that much. I think that uh, what's going to happen, and I'll talk some about, about specifics, is sort of the normal ebb and flow between Republican and Democratic administrations uh, in the antitrust agencies to give a sense of the stakes here, the range, uh, if you will, which is important. I spend all of my time talking about these small differences and the things I write about and think about, but I think it's important to describe uh, what's at stake accurately. So uh, the, in monopolization cases, I think if you a took the average of the number of sort of single firm conduct monopolization cases uh, under the Obama administration versus the Bush administration prior, we're talking about the difference between zero and one, or maybe one to two litigated cases. Um, merger policy is pretty darn steady. You, the, the margin might move. If you were to look at activity numbers, just the number of second requests, the number of challenges, they're going to be identical. Right? The marginal merger changes. Maybe in a Republican administration it's four to three as opposed to five to four. Um, maybe in the Republican administration people propose sort of more adventurous mergers in the hope that they get them through. Uh, but the number of challenges, the number of second requests, the workload on the agencies is identical. Okay? Um, You'll see some changes on the monopolization front, to be sure. I think one of the things that uh, Acting Chairman Olhausen has done at the FTC, sort of consistent with her work over her career at the agency, is to make a big deal out of the state action cases. Um, that is to use the resources of the Federal Trade Commission to go after conduct that we know is bad has pernicious consumer welfare effects. Uh, to spend a little bit less time on cases where we're not sure. Right? We have a a hunch, maybe it's 60% likely the conduct harms consumers, not this state cartel stuff. We know it's bad. We might lose in court, state action defenses and so forth, but the risk there isn't that we're wrong, the risk is litigation risk. Uh, uh, the chair, uh, excuse me, uh, <coughs> Chairman Olhausen uh, has set up a task force to work on these problems. It's been something she's worked on her whole career. That sort of shift is, I think, the one that you, uh, can expect to see from the agencies. But wild shifts, I think, are out. I think they're unlikely. I know they're fun to talk about. Uh, they're not going to happen. Um, we could talk about whether they should happen. So for example, um, there are lots of calls and, you know, all around. You heard some of it today that there's something dramatically different in markets now that should require that sort of big shift um, with the premise that I already told you, not gonna happen, I'll talk about it a little bit. Um, so the uh, University of Chicago has this big conference on, you know, are markets really concentrated now? Is it the end of the world? Should we do something different with antitrust? I think that was the title of the conference. <laughs> um, and they don't invite any university, real University of Chicago guys that are the guys you're talking about. Um, you know, but they get this conference and they all agree it's the end of the world. Um, and. Uh, to the credit, the CEA and the Obama administration put out a report that's sort of the basis for all of this stuff. Um, and Jason Furman, who's an excellent economist, uh, sort of uh, is in charge of this program. And they put out a paper that says, look, we're going to put out some evidence that says markets are much more concentrated. And here's, you can read the paper on your own, but I'm going to give you uh, my summary. So they go out, and what they do is they take um, what are called data people, you know, uh, in, the, in the economic consensus, two-digit SAIC codes. So this isn't like what the relevant market in daily fantasy sports is. It's either like fantasy sports or daily fantasy sports. How it could be daily fantasy sports when it, okay. Um, but it's one of those two things. And you can measure shares and talk about effects if you want. That's a two-digit SIC code is like things made with metal. Right, like some things with metal don't compete with each other. It's, it's really hard to think about economics in the context of a market definition of stuff made with rubber, right? Um, 
But what they do is they say, let's measure using these two-digit SIC codes um, how much more concentrated the world's become. And here's the, the big punchline. They went out and they measured the, what's called the C50, was, which was a measure that people used in economics in the 30s. Uh, and they said, well, can aggregate the share of the top 50 firms. Hint, if you've got 50 firms, <laughs> it may inform whether you've got a competition problem. Um, but let's measure the number of C50s that are over 30%, meaning the average share of a firm of those 50 is, you do the algebra, 0.6%. So if we've got an average more than 0.6%, they count these as concentrated, the number of industries that met that criteria, a C50 over 30%, went up about 8% over the last 30 years. <coughs> if you take out telecom, the effect disappears. Anyway, I'll let you go read the report on your own and decide whether you should stop breathing or not. Um, I have decided not to. Okay. But but to each their own on that on that front. So this is sort of my pitch for I, I don't I it's hard for me to get excited about that or think that some great reinvention of antitrust uh, is required. Uh, if the agency is defining markets sometimes as premium natural organic supermarkets, uh, in, in I mean. So you're looking for competition problems. There's not a lack of desire in the agencies to find them. I don't think we need any reinvention of motivation for the agencies. So what is actually going to happen? Uh, I think that it's fair to say we could identify at least a couple of areas based on, um, somewhat based on personnel in the agency, FTC, we can't say much about that yet, um, but also based at least in part on traditional shifts in focus when you move from a Democratic to Republican administration. Um, and so I'll kind of lump those reasons together, but talk about a couple of areas that I think deserve attention, are likely to get attention. Uh, one is perhaps the most important change that's happened in antitrust in the last 50 years has nothing to do with the U.S. It is that 50 years ago there were less to, fewer than a dozen antitrust agencies. There is now more than 130. Um, and even 20 years ago, there were three or four antitrust agencies that mattered, uh, and the rest sort of followed and got in line. There are 10 to 12 that matter a great deal to whether it makes sense for a company to merge or not. Um, that landscape is an important one. It's been coming for a while. The antitrust agencies have you know, international offices that work uh, in conjunction with those uh, other enforcers. They, they try to aim for convergence on process, sometimes substance too, um, that's a really big deal. More than ever, it matters what our US antitrust officials say and what we do, because the spillover effects are much more significant and much more likely. I cannot tell you how many times uh, I spent a lot of time in China when I was a commissioner talking to, to agency officials from the three Chinese agencies. I cannot tell you the number of times um, that an official from um, Mofcom or the NDRC in China said to me, well, I hear what you're saying about this case or that case, but your commissioner X gave a speech where they said, um, and so it's fine, we can do what we want. Uh, they pay attention. They pay close attention to these things. It matters a great deal to the behavior of the other agencies, what the U.S. says and does. I agree uh, with, I think, I think both Jeff and Bert said, it is probably true that the U.S. is no longer um, sort of firmly holding the lead in international antitrust. Uh, I view that as a bad thing. Uh, and I view that as a bad thing not so much because um, I'm going to ignore the time card for a second. Uh, not so much uh, because of um, you know, some view that the U.S. Um, you know, U.S. law to dominate or anything like that. Uh, I'm not a big fan of the idea that these international systems have to replicate ours. We have private rights of action. We have all sorts of stuff that leads us to our system. Um, but out of the view that the economists that work inside of our agencies and the DOJ and FTC uh, antitrust has been an economic enterprise uh, in which economists have played an important role in the U.S. for much longer than anywhere else in the world. It is, if we are looking for an evidence-based antitrust regime, um, the infrastructure to do that 
uh, the comparative advantage because of that infrastructure to do that lies here. Uh, and it requires leadership that are willing to, especially on things like um, the role of intellectual property uh, and antitrust, willing to go into other countries and say, we think we know what the right approach is. Here is the evidence that supports that. And we think you ought to do it and to say so publicly. That, I think, has been missing for at least a decade. It is important to note that those issues, those international issues, are uh, the track record for making Del Rahin and for Maureen Ohazan are incredibly strong on both of those fronts. And so I think there is some reason for optimism in that regard. And now I'll stop. Thank you, Josh, for that. Um, let me, uh, before we uh, get to uh, the audience, uh, ask uh, people to, to focus on each other's remarks a minute. And, and let me particularly uh, draw on the fact that <clears throat> several of you talked about the movement to a much more global competitive environment, the fact that uh, particularly in uh, the information area and the uh, high technology area, we are in a, a, a definitely global uh, market. What difference would that make to you uh, from the standpoint of uh, what you would recommend for antitrust enforcement or what you think will happen with antitrust enforcement? And you know, Jeff, you can start. We can, you uh, and, and, and you can feel free to criticize one another as you go. <laughs> well, l luckily, Josh reiterated everything I said with one exception. So, so I, I basically got to talk twice. Yeah, that, that's why we're docking his pay. <laughs> um, uh, you, you mean enforcement in the U.S., I assume, right? Um, you know, so there I guess, uh, two things I would want to say about that. Number one is that um, there, the, I have heard some people say, uh, uh, and, and others intimate, and they may or may not mean it, that one of the ways, or maybe the way, to re regain the um, the global antitrust crown is to step up enforcement. That that by some in some sense the the uh, international metric is how much enforcement are you doing. Um, uh, there is always a tendency in antitrust to sort of count the number of cases you've brought uh, as an indication that you're doing a good job. Of course, that doesn't follow at all. But but that is. Uh, uh, often done, uh, and a lot of people who point to Europe as as being you know the the real antitrust uh, enforcer today. It's partly because they are much more active. Um, so so the, the first thing I would say is that um, that I would I would want obviously a, a resistance to that. And as Josh points out, I don't think either Maureen or or Macon is, is would be inclined to try to reestablish international prim primacy by by engaging in more enforcement just to sort of um, show that they could do so. But Josh is absolutely right that, that um, uh, agencies elsewhere look to the, the US, um, or, or I should say uh, it, it's not absolutely correct. In a way, uh, the increase in the number of antitrust agencies around the world um, um, it, it masks a little bit that, that in a sense there is a global duel between the EU and the US for who is going to, who are these agencies going to look to um, uh, as the source for, um, for their uh, in enforcement um, framework. Uh, and the EU arguably is sort of winning out uh, in, in a lot of places. Uh, and I, I absolutely think that we, we can and should do a lot to reclaim that in terms of directly going to, to other countries like Josh did, like Maureen does, and, uh, and in particular on uh, relating to the IP issues. But it also goes to the sorts of things like the Section 2 report, like um, uh, new uh, vertical merger guidelines. Those haven't been revised since 1984. Um, uh, that's an opportunity to, to put down to en engage in some real economic analysis, some real evidence-based analysis, and to come up with a sort of uh, you know, guidelines for how appropriately to deal with those issues. And there, there are narrower issues like uh, MFNs, which have become very Im important around the world. Uh, I think most places are following the, well, the EU is leading in this. I think they, they um, uh, occasionally get it right, but often get it very wrong. Uh, that's an opportunity for the U.S. to come in and say, here's what the economics really tells you. Uh, and they don't have to do that through enforcement. They can do that through speeches and, 
uh, and the like, but also, and very importantly, through the kinds of, of um, well-considered guidelines that, uh, that the agencies occasionally put out and should do. Um, first of all, I agree with uh, my colleagues on what's likely to happen. Uh, I don't foresee major uh, changes in, in direction, and not quickly, although, uh, you know, it depends on how long a particular administration stays in power, and, uh, and <coughs> changes tend to be uh, incremental. Um, sometimes they're, they're rapid, but you've got a court system that's in place uh, with uh, a lot of precedent that's going to tend to be followed. And you've got uh, professionals who uh, have uh, uh, an investment in uh, the learning that they have and in the way that things work. So uh, I have to take a, a conservative view on uh, the rapidity with which change will actually occur. In terms of the international uh, arena, I've been, I've been paying a lot of attention lately to um, culture and to the effects of culture on uh, different uh, economic and political systems. Uh, ultimately, I would like to try to understand uh, how cultures affect attitudes toward competition and even <coughs> antitrust. What I come out with at this point, and this also reflects about 10 years of working with the International Competition Network as a non-governmental advisor, is that there are <coughs> differences in national heritage that are going to be continually important, even as, as one uh, Latin American writer uh, put it, uh, the, the laws in, uh, in some of the South American countries are basically the same as ours, but that doesn't mean they're going to be enforced in the same way, because they've got experiences with uh, colonialism and Catholicism and uh, uh, other parts of their heritage that are just going to make them different. And we're dealing with sovereign countries. So what do you take from that? I say you can't be uh, overly optimistic in anticipating harmonization uh, around the world. There is going to be a lot of increasing similarity in the way we discuss these issues, but we won't always come out the same. Um, and that's important because uh, the way you approach it, and here I'm getting back to America first, this is diplomatic. This is about soft power. This is about our ability to influence other countries by when they see that what we do uh, makes sense and works. It's not by shouting out them or saying, uh, uh, the U.S. invented antitrust, and so you got to do it our way, or even saying we've got the best economists in the world, which is probably still true. Um, but uh, it, it requires showing respect and listening to people and, and respecting differences. I, I think as a country, we have a failure of, uh, of uh, understanding other peoples uh, well enough and sympathetically enough. And, and that worries me about populism because it goes in the opposite direction. Did you want to jump in, Josh? I do. A couple quick things. <laughs> um, one, sort of a, a last comment on the, on the global stuff. Um, I, I agree with everything that Bert said about the importance of how we message. So the institute I run at, at, Sc at Scalia Law School, the Global Antitrust Institute, I spend... I don't know. I think my, the number in the last two years is I've taught, had a week-long session teaching economics to judges or regulators in these countries. I think I'm up to 200 judges and 500 regulators in the last two years in China, in Korea, in Brazil, et cetera. Um, the most interesting thing I've learned in my experiences in those countries with the staff who are doing the cases uh, is that the demand, uh, in China in particular, the demand for um, these guys were plucked from a price regulator where they were setting the price of eggs and said, now you do antitrust. Um, the demand for uh, being educated on the skill set that they need to do this stuff is incredibly high. Uh, the level of discontent from those agencies with the feedback they've got from domestic agencies, um, I, I think, is high. I, I think 
I would like to see, and it must be done in a particular way, I would like to see our agencies much more active um, in those exchanges, not just in the training, but it is, it is a, I mean, I'm an academic, so maybe I'm a little desensitized to this notion, but it is fully possible and even a good thing for your life uh, to be able to find somebody to tell that they're wrong and do it in a respectful way and be able to accept it in return. And that is okay, and, and, and the agencies can do it. I think we've shied away from doing it, um, and we ought to stop. Uh, two things domestically that I think are worth paying attention to, sort of get out of the, the international bit, in terms of ways to... Um, influence the trajectory of antitrust. I mean, the, the biggest turn in the history of antitrust late 70s into the 80s uh, was caused by a lot of things, changes in economic thinking, but perhaps most <laughs> importantly, a huge influx in, in the number of judges with <coughs> experience in antitrust, interest in antitrust, a worldview consistent with law and economics and so forth. Judge Ginsburg, Steve Williams, um, Easterbrook, Posner, et cetera, that had a giant influence on the shaping of the law during that time period. Uh, if there is going to be dramatic change in antitrust, it won't be from what the agencies are doing. It'll be from judicial appointments, uh, which is, you know, so as slow as the administration is going and creating, uh, getting new commissioners up, moving pretty quick on judges. Um, and so I, I, I think if there is an area where there will be significant change, it will be uh, it will be with judges. Uh, domestically, I think there are a whole host of issues where small marginal changes are important. I'll just sort of throw them out in case anybody wants to talk about them or ask questions, but areas where I think there will be marginal change that's important. Um, I think that the agencies, because of all of this attention on what to make of structure, I mean the structure versus economics debate and antitrust has been around a long time, it'll stay around a long time, but they're having whole conferences over this saying we have to change the world. So it's getting a lot of attention. Um, I think the agency is sort of making a stand. I actually think that this FanDuel DraftKings is an excellent sort of test case for this of uh, do we count the number of firms with our fingers or do we do economics? Um, I think the world is going to watch domestically what the agencies are doing in cases like that. Uh, HSR reform is an issue uh, that you know, more than most of what we're talking about, more, most real companies are really concerned about uh, be the cost of compliance with HSR. Vertical merger guidelines has been an idea that's been floated by both administrations. Somebody's got to write them. Um, and I'll, I'll throw out the Robinson-Packman Act because you started it. Um, but I think if there's marginal change on can, this can thing. You, can you throw, throw out, out the, yeah. the Robinson? <laughs> if, if there's marginal change on this thing, it actually will be to throw out that pernicious piece of legislation uh, more than modify it to do sort of teach it new tricks. Uh, and I, you know, I know that that's something that uh, Senate Judiciary has at least eyeballed. But um, both, of, but both you, uh, Josh and, and Jeff, mentioned the the vertical uh, merger guidelines and uh, mergers get a lot of attention. You know, the, those that's the part of antitrust the public sees the, the most clearly. Um, right now, one of the big mergers uh, on the table is the AT and T uh, Time Warner uh, merger, which I think everyone uh, who looks at it says this is really a vertical uh, merger. It's not a horizontal one. Do you expect that there would be? Uh, what difference would it make if the uh, antitrust authorities were to turn that down or throw a monkey wrench into it? Would that signal a, a, a grave shock? And, and, and what is your expectation? Uh, I was say one thing quickly that, that I'm shocked Josh didn't have on his list because he's talked about it for years, and that is um, uh, uh, efficiencies and, and uh, the, you know, the sort of the, the supply side. Uh, um, uh, analysis in, in mergers and, and for, for me anyway in particular the role of out of market efficiencies um, <coughs> excuse me <coughs> is the kind of marginal change I'd like to see and I think could could happen and it, and it, and it relates to your, your question um, which makes it I don't so think, much better which is great right I don't I don't think there's any way that this um, uh, that the uh, AT and T merger gets through. I can't remember exactly how you phrased the question, but but it's hard to imagine um, uh, this administration anyway um, uh, not not allowing the merger through. I I, there's just no basis on uh, under current law and understanding of the economics on which to uh, on which to challenge it. And and you know to your question, I I, I do think that it's certainly the case that. Um, 
Uh, so my, my one prediction would be um, that, uh, I, don't, I don't know if this is really a deviation from the past, but at least in the areas that I'm most familiar with, including you know, telecom and high-tech industries, I think we will see more uh, vertical integration, or at least efforts to engage in more vertical integration, particularly in, in telecom. Uh, so it's important what happens uh, in, in that case. It's important what happens in uh, the Monsanto and, and Bayer and, uh, and Dow DuPont mergers as well. Um, for, for similar reasons, um, but I think they'll, they'll go the right way and for the right reasons. Um, uh, and and I, I think in, in particular, it's because of something that, that Bird said, that uh, um, if we properly look at, at dynamic economics, uh, particularly in the markets that, that AT&T is operating in, there's no question <coughs> what the, that, that, that the pace of change is, um, is uh, is rapid that um, uh, that any kind of analysis that would try to thwart this merger would have to be based on uh, on uh, looking at markets that 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 certain that, that barely exist today but certainly won't exist in a couple of years uh, and, and it's really crucial that we that we do that and again I think I think this administration absolutely will um, to, much to their credit is, is Josh is that uh is that something you agree with? Uh, you have to say yes. Yeah. It's, you can just are, nod. There there are things in there I, I, I agree with. Um, <laughs> but as Jeff's, I'll find something to disagree with. Um, so it won't really be a disagreement. Yeah, but I'll fake it. Um, <laughs> so <clears throat> I don't think what this administration does, this is sorry to, to, to disappoint people, it's not going to be different than what they would have done. I mean, the staff is going to look at it. The facts matter. I've not looked at all the evidence in the merger, but I suspect that what happens with the merger is just what the DOJ does. I am skeptical they will challenge, and I'm skeptical they will challenge because if you look at the body of uh, literature on the competitive effects of vertical mergers, there's, there's a large literature on, on this um, that the agencies are very, very aware of. Generally pro-competitive or competitively neutral, um, and they're hard to win vertical merger cases if you challenge them and, and, and go to court. Now that doesn't mean the outcome might be um, you end up getting some sort of cheap consent or something like that uh, to make it go away quickly. Um, but I'm skeptical you end up with a real challenge of the I, merger. I, so I w there is some disagreement here. I just want to flag that, that I, I totally agree with you about the staff. Of course, I agree with you about the constraints of the uh, of the courts, as I've said a couple of times. Um, but as you point out, uh, um, th there is certainly the possibility of uh, politicization at, above the staff level, uh, more so presumably at the DOJ than at the FTC, but also at the FTC. Um, I suspect that you would have uh, disagreed with the chairman less had it been in a, a, a Republican administration than, than a Democratic one. Or, well, of course, you would have been the chairman, I guess. So, uh, but um, uh, he, he so, could so have been of two minds. Though. <laughs> that's yeah. possible. So, I mean, uh, it's not to say that the outcomes would be d different, but it is to say that 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 the um, the threat w could be could be heightened. That that you, you're right. Nobody wants to lose cases, um, and and again, you know, I don't want to oversell it, but I think that's a pretty clear loser of a case. But that doesn't mean that you you if you couldn't imagine political reasons that even though the staff said this is a loser of a case, that the the po political uh, decision makers wouldn't say, well, let's at, let's at least um, uh, let's at least, you know, get some sort of a settlement here, which, um, which of course, the, the, the companies will gladly enter into, and everyone gets to call it a win. And at the end of the day, that marginally moves things in the wrong direction. I was a political appointee in an agency long enough to vaguely know what you're talking about. Uh, vaguely. Well, let, let me see if I can, can take that and tie it into something you said, Bert. Um, one of the things you, you were talking about is persuading other agencies around the world to follow what we do by showing that there are good results to it. And one of the points that is often made about economic analysis is that it is more determined, not that it's, it's uh, completely determined, but it's more determinate than a lot of other methods of analysis. It gives better predictive qualities to the decisions of the agencies and, and narrows the ambit of discretion, which is good for a lot of purposes, but not necessarily good for political appointees who run these agencies, particularly not 
necessarily in other parts of the world. Do you see those as intention, uh, and, and do you see those a, as serious concerns in how we uh, promote what we do? Well, I th I think that uh, other other countries are looking at what we do, but uh, I think they're also necessarily just same way as as here. There's necessarily some over overtones of politics when highly salient uh, cases come forward. And uh, the, because of the way we discuss these cases with economic jargon, with econometrics, uh, with Herfindahl numbers, the public doesn't know what the hell we're talking about or why we're talking about it. So they don't really get it. And uh, I think part of that is that uh, we've gotten away from structural presumptions and made everything into uh, trying to analyze and make predictions about efficiency, which is not that scientific a term and, uh, uh, and not, a, not a, in my mind, not a, an adequate uh, basis for the whole structure that's been built on it. Um, so I, th I think that uh, having a certain amount of uh, politics not, not necessarily the politics in the dirty word, but politics in terms of the statesmanship for what's, what's good for a country and what do the people care about and where are we trying to go? Where are we, what do we want out of our economy? And if we get too far away from what uh, people want, I don't mean the people, but I mean you know people who vote, uh, we're going to lose something that's very good. So I think that uh, we need to be able to uh, talk about this in ways that uh, uh, people do understand and do it in a way that uh, leads to some results where we, we may have excellent predictability, but if the prediction is the big guys are going to get bigger, and that's almost inevitable, that's the way it works, I don't, this is like a, a rigged system. And I think that we need to reconsider where we want to go with this. I, 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 do, I, I do think one of the things I've seen over time is that while big guys tend to get bigger in a lot of industries, uh, they can get small in a hurry. And uh, I, I remember uh, in one of the cases the uh, antitrust authorities uh, were thinking of bringing when they were bringing cases against AT&T on the theory that uh, there would never be a competition to landlines and uh, to IBM on the theory there would never be competition to mainframe computing. They were also thinking of, of ginning up a case against General Motors on the theory that imports would never be a constraint on American manufacturing. So well, the point about that I think you made, and, and I think uh, Josh and, and Jeff did as well, about having to look at the dynamics of the economy is a powerful one when we are just worried about, about firm size. Let me ask for... Um, questions from the audience. Uh, let me remind you there's a, a large number of uh, law professors on the panel, so if you don't have questions for us, we will ask questions of you. Um, I know many of you have not done the work and are not eager to be called on, so that puts pressure on you to ask something first. There are microphones, and I will ask people to, to line up at, at the microphones to, to ask questions. You want to? Um, why don't you come to this one? And Leaving aside remarks. And, and please, let me just ask I'm that sorry. you identify yourself first. Sure. Marianne McGrail, uh, an attorney in D.C. Um, leaving aside remarks made on the campaign trail would, and this is a question for all, panel, all the panelists, do you think that there are particular reasons uh, as to why the antitrust regime in the United States had a difficult time grappling with internet companies, if you believe that that is the case? And is that true of all radically new technologies? Let me give a partial answer, which they will dispute. Uh, I feel confident. I was ready to dispute it before you even said yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> they, they being the people. I, when I... Uh, <laughs> Um, when I look at uh, uh, Google and Amazon and these other networks, and I see a strong potential that in certain areas at least they will become 
uh, monopolists, maybe natural monopolists. Maybe there's only room for one. And looking in that direction, if that's the case, then the question becomes, how would government deal with these companies if they become considered to be monopolists? Are they then public utilities? And the way we've treated public utilities in the past is we regulate them. We regulate them as to price and uh, reliability and things like that, entry. Um, how would you do it without, for instance, if it's Google, without uh, having real First Amendment problems? How would you do it when their internal policy planners and economists and technicians are going to be able to run circles around any government that tries to regulate them? So I say, let's avoid that by having a stronger vertical restraint policy, and let's not let a platform uh, with where there's likely to be only one or two or maybe three platforms in a space. We're no longer talking about narrowly defined markets. We're talking about a space. Have a policy that keeps them from uh, acquiring companies that have to use the platform. Because the biggest problem we see seems to be a, a kind of a, a, a duality where the owner of the platform uh, eventually either uh, buys up uh, the people, one of the uh, leaders that uh, would be on the platform, then has the potential of giving them uh, superior access, superior terms, or uh, can, can uh, have tremendous power over uh, the the tenants of the platform space, uh, we have to worry about how we're dealing with that. The, the Europeans are at least worrying about it. I, what they're going to do, I don't know. Getting a good remedy is really tough, and I think that's why they've had so much delay in getting a Google case out. But I think the answer is one of, uh, of a stronger vertical merger policy. Well, it's a, it's well, a let, merger let me see if we can get, let me see if we can get a, a response before we go to the next question. Sorry, I should say, in the first place, it's not a problem, I guess. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't think the U.S. has had trouble grappling with these companies because uh, I, don't, I don't think they've done anything that needs to be grappled with. Um, uh, and they certainly have spent a, a great deal of time investigating and, and thinking about them. And, and in fact, uh, uh, d dealing with um, uh, bringing, in particular, some consumer protection actions against them, whether appropriately or not. Um, uh, there's no natural monopoly here. One of the, this is one, this is the reason why I get concerned about the kind of rhetoric that we hear. Not that uh, Josh is absolutely right. Not that it's going to have a uh, an, an easy um, uh, effect. Or it's going to change the way courts look at things. Um, uh, but you know, talking about these companies like they're natural monopolies, as if as if all that matters for a monopoly is the number of firms instead of the actual structure of the market and the the, the barriers to entry and the various things that actually create natural uh, uh, lead to uh, natural monopoly outcomes, and then suggesting they per perhaps be regulated like public utilities. I mean, uh, Bird at least backed away from that, but but <laughs> that there are thousands of people out there who haven't backed away from it. Uh, and, and I don't think they really know what they're talking about, and I, but I worry that it will have an influence on, uh, on invest at, at least at the sort of investigation level, possibly at the enforcement level. Luckily, the courts, I think, for now anyway, will prevent anything really terrible from happening. Um, uh, and, and with respect to the, the vertical uh, restraints point, um, I guess in a way I'd be sort of okay if, if it were limited to, to actual mergers, although often those, of course, can be extraordinarily uh, um, uh, efficiency enhancing themselves. But the vast majority of the conduct that I see people complaining about um, uh, on these, these platforms didn't come about because of, of mergers, and they're still going to complain about them. Uh, and and uh, it's not going to solve the problem, um, the problem of the complaints anyway. And meanwhile, the conduct itself is is, is self-evidently pro-competitive. It may, ha of course, it has lo every, you know, everything creates losers at some level. And 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 I certainly take take to heart your point that eventually, that can have a populist sort of backlash, uh, and it's and it's worth thinking about that. Um, but let's let the companies think about that. 
I don't think we need to, to sort of do it for them and say, listen, hey, if you, if, if, if you get too big, uh, uh, you know, you're going to have real problems, so why don't we break you up before you get too big as if they can't figure out for themselves that they might, they might have problems. Maybe they can. But uh, anyway, so I, I, I don't think there's been a problem. Josh, you look like you're ready to, to ten second, second Ten second answer. Um, I agree with Jeff. <laughs> a different 10 second answer um, the agency to, to say that the US doesn't even worry about this or didn't in Google is, is, is wrong I, the, the FTC dealt with that case before as a commissioner I didn't vote on the case the FTC took exactly this theory about being concerned about placing your own results over other stuff and they did what an agency is supposed to do and they said, let's take that theory te and, and, and test it with data to see if we reject the hypothesis or not. Um, the FTC took data, they tested the hypothesis, and they decided unanimously um, on that count not to bring a case. In um, a Democratic administration. In, in a Democratic administration, which brought lots of cases. Um, I think to begin with the presumption that somehow the analysis they did was uh, like a uh, fake news of some sort is probably the wrong way to go and I think discredits the economists and lawyers who worked on that case. So I think the, the record requires uh, correcting on that. Now, the Euro Europeans may have got the same results as the U.S. guys and then brought the case anyway. They may have said no evidence of consumer harm, but we're doing something different and that's a debate worth having. Uh, but to say that the U.S. is not concerned, they spent a lot of man hours for something they weren't concerned with if they were not concerned. And uh, as somebody who uh, messed up a lot of otherwise unanimous votes in my day at the commission, uh, getting unanimous votes hard. And they got it there. And I think the appropriate presumption is they got it because the commissioners were persuaded there was not a case. Um, Professor Wright. And again, uh, oh, would you Sure, yeah. Uh, Mike O'Connor. I'm an attorney at Quinn Emanuel here in DC. Uh, Professor Wright, I just wanted to uh, key off something you uh, said in your opening statement and ask a question about it. You, you mentioned that you talk to, uh, for example, Chinese officials, and, and they've keyed on statements and speeches and, and, and dissenting opinions made um, to, to go in a different direction. Uh, my question is, do you, do you think that's an actual part of the decision-making process, or do you think it's a way to justify a decision that's already been made? The latter more than the former, sometimes the former. Um, I, I think there's a combination. Look, I mean, to talk about what the Chinese agencies uh, do or what their approach is is difficult because that's a moving target. The point of the US-EU sort of battle for the hearts and minds of the Chinese agencies, sort of battle for global antitrust mind share, um, is that that's undecided. I mean, the Chinese, the AML came in uh, less than 10 years ago. If you were to look at the state of U.S. antitrust law in 1900, there's lots of embarrassing bad stuff in there that we could wag our finger at. By all accounts, you know, they're, they're doing fairly well in the sort of historical sense. Uh, but I think what those agencies are going to be when they grow up is yet to be decided. Um, so I don't think they're always searching for cover. I think that there are groups in those agencies, like there are groups in the FTC or groups in the DOJ, with different views. And the way that those disputes play out is, you know, um, I've got some evidence that helps advance my view inside the agency. And one piece of evidence might be, look what the AUS FTC did. Um, so I think that's a little bit a, a way of saying both. But I do think that this, that's more the latter sort of the cover answer than the former. E even when something is cover, though, it, it does become endogenous, so that yep. over time, if you get people talking a certain way, you get people thinking a certain way, and if they're thinking a certain way, it can have constraining effects on what even the, the political uh, folks are doing. And that's been one of the concerns mm -hmm. about moving away from uh, a uh, relatively determinate economic analysis, you know, and, and I use relatively as a, a, an all-caps term here, move toward a more multi-factor test. You know, um, you, you were talking about other factors which people often throw in. Uh, my friend uh, Nino Scalia used to talk about these tests as, as ones where you were asking, is this line longer than this rock is heavy? Um, it, it's a little hard to integrate uh, multiple factors. I think we had another question over here. Yes, thanks. Um, to the extent that you're following it and care to comment, um, 
So internet service, incumbent inter internet service providers have in a number of state legislatures argued that it's unfair for municipalities to build and own their own fiber because it's, you know, state-sponsored competition. Um, not state as in the level of government, but like, you know, from the, the state. Um, but um, the financing models for these municipally owned uh, infrastructure, um, it comes from people, they're, they're bonded and people will be paying them back. I wonder um, how much you think that might factor into an appeal that municipalities might bring to the Sixth Circuit Court which ruled uh, with the ISPs, you know, saying that they have a right to make these laws in state legislatures blocking municipalities from building their own infrastructure. What's the c c argument for competition on either side, I guess? I, I don't think it'll factor, if, if, they, if they try to appeal the decision, that, that, I don't think that'll factor in at all. The, the decision was, you know, was largely uh, based on precedent that has to do much more with the, the um, <coughs> excuse me, with, um, with uh, separate, not separate, uh, what's the other one? You know, federalism and, and the relationship of the, the state to municipalities and, and it was an administrative law um, and competition wasn't really part of it. There are the rhetorical argument, not in the case, no. I mean, not in the actual legal case, no. There are competition issues. I, we can talk about that n later. But Any, anyone want to contradict you? So I, not on this. Oh, okay. William <laughs> Martin, um, it's a common place for the news and for commentators to draw conclusions about dissatisfaction of line attorneys, say, at the Civil Rights Division or the EPA during Republican administrations. Does anyone have an explanation for why the plummet in morale at the antitrust division over the last eight years has been studiously ignored, uh, such that it's not even reported, much less incorporated into an analysis of the leadership? What's the, just, what's the evidence of the plummet in morale? What is the evidence of the plummet in morale? The fact that no one here knows about it sort of verifies my point. No, I'm asking an honest uh, question. Uh, is the question, I understand your point is no, no one is talking about it. Is, it. is the premise that there is a plummet in morale happening? Yes, and if, if in your oversight of the transition no one has told you that, you need to ask different questions. That, that, okay, so that's not a question, but I think I have a response. Um, so I know the agencies pretty well. I, I worked in the FTC in, in, in particular. I don't think you know my role in the transition or whether it has FTC. Maybe I was an FTC only guy, right? Um, but I, I take your criticism of the questions I asked to heart and I will, I will, I will duly note it next time around. Um, but with respect to the plummet in morale, it's honestly, I'm around a lot of DOJ and FTC lawyers. It's not something I've heard uh, ever. Not in the transition, not talking to DOJ line attorneys, some of whom I've, I, I eat and drink with on a regular basis. And maybe they don't just like to tell me I'm, I'm not a nice guy or wh whatever, but it's, it's honestly I, the first I can, time. I can vouch for that. Yeah, so it's honestly the first time I've heard that. So I, I don't have much to say about um, be, I, I'd, I'd be happy to. Let me go to the next question. Laura Peterson, I'm an attorney and economist. A question for so Jeff. that's two strikes already. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> question for Jeff and also for Joshua, different questions. Jeffrey, what are your specific recommendations for changes, if any, in the uh, merger guidelines regarding efficiencies? And my question for Joshua would be, one can infer, <laughs> hopefully correctly, or, well, one can infer from your comments uh, a support for the certain of the economic education, in effect, efforts of the ICN, the International Competition Network. How would you reform the ICN if you had your druthers? Um, and to what extent is it a necessary supplement to private sector efforts, such as those that you yourself have engaged in to help to educate antitrust enforcers abroad? That's a great question. So since she got to ask the second question, you had time to think about the first one. Oh, yeah. Yes, I did. But I, but, 
I would say, um, I would, even if I hadn't thought about it, I would have said, uh, I'd like to see uh, some, uh, uh, I'd like to see the agencies considering out of market uh, efficiencies, what would be deemed out of market efficiencies, um, uh, put differently, a, a recognition that that in market and out of market doesn't quite mean the same thing anymore, um, which is itself a recognition of the problems of, of market definition. Um, we, you know, we, we adjusted that t to some extent with the 2010 horizontal merger guidelines um, and not suggesting we adopt precisely the same approach, but I think something that broke down uh, the, the strict reliance on, um, uh, on market definition uh, but in particular, uh, with respect to efficiencies. Um, similarly, I guess the other the other big issue is that um, uh, is the extent of of proof and um, uh, required rel for, to to make out a prima facie case uh, relative to um, uh, the rebuttal with efficiencies. And uh, I, I actually don't know for sure how that's done at the uh, uh, at the agency level. I'm sure it varies. Obviously, they have no obligation to do it any any way they at all. Um, and often they probably don't really count the efficiencies. Um, it's more of an issue when they get to court. And so I would I would certainly like to see cases being brought. Uh, I'm sorry. I would like to see cases not being brought. Uh, where there are efficiencies and where they are um, uh, instead, and, and to make sure that they're not bringing cases to court because they know they might be able to win them because the uh, the extent of proof required to establish the efficiencies in, in the court is going to give them a kind of a win that they, in a sense, may not deserve. Josh? So I am a... Uh, you know, I spend a lot of my time doing economic education for, for judges and regulators. Uh, so um, far be it from me to say I don't, I don't think it's an important sort of mission. Um, the question about, uh, uh, you know, the economic education attempts by uh, efforts of the ICN, and this is, you know, asking me to aid a rival. <laughs> uh, um, but... I, I will say this, I think the appetite for economic education at these agencies is really important. Um, I think uh, the more the merrier, sort of trying to do that. Oftentimes I think efforts of uh, international groups, and I don't know the nuts and bolts of the I, what the ICN programs look like enough, so that this should not be a, taken as a criticism of their, their specific programs. But my experience at the FTC was oftentimes our uh, technical assistance efforts um, and in terms of economics or some of these other groups, international groups, what people try to do is go overseas and say the U.S. approach is X and they've got a lot of slides that just sort of list the U.S. approach over and over and over um, and then explain it and, and that's not economic education. Uh, it's a longer run game. And you have pe tell people what a demand curve is, right? And teach them how to calculate elasticity of demand and why that matters to doing merger analysis. And it's a longer run game that requires investment and patience and seeing the same people over and over and having them ask you, I understand you're trying to teach me a demand curve, but I have a case today. And fighting off the temptation to say, all right, let me tell you what you should do with your case. It is a long-term investment that the antitrust community needs to make in those agencies. It's a slightly different problem for, there are agencies that have the resources to hire in-house economists that don't. Um, they've got their own problem. They need to hire economists, and they need to structure the agency in a way that gives the economist the ability to have input on, on cases. That's a, a separate problem. That 130 includes agencies that have um, zero economists and zero hope of ever having one. And that's a different problem. It's not economic education. It's, um, you know, sort of resource sharing by those agencies um, to try to share some of that capital. And those are two different problems uh, that I think are going to become much, much, much more important over the next 10, 20 years. Uh, agencies like uh, the TFTC right, in, in, in Taiwan, uh, a couple of economist commissioners, which is always a good idea. Um, but at the staff level, not, not, not so much. So that agency, incredibly important, high level of economic significance, but the, the problem's not just 
training. We're going to try to do that too. It's just the resources are thin. Same in China. You know, Mofcom, you had 12 case handlers handling a huge amount of cases um, who all need that sort of training. And so uh, we I have guess my punchline is very supportive of all the efforts. Yeah, we, we, we have time for, for a quick comment, quick. Bert, and then a yes. very quick last question. Uh, well, three, three quick additions. Uh, ICN, especially through its uh, working groups, really does a lot of uh, training types of activity. And the leader in that uh, has largely been the Federal Trade Commission. Our Federal Trade Commission has been really good at uh, supporting these efforts. What I worry about in the budget is whether any kind of international involvement will remain in the budget. And I, I think there's a – litigators typically don't want to see money going toward planning or toward uh, long-range international soft power. They want to fight their cases. And so uh, those budget questions are going to be terribly important as, as cutting goes ahead. Thank you. Quick last question, yeah. quick last answer. I'll, I'll try to be quick. Uh, my name's John Delacourt. I'm with the Plasma Protein Therapeutics Association. So uh, PPTA is a global trade association. Um, because of that, my question is about the, uh, the international education. PPTA has a lot of interests outside of the U.S., and certainly the plasma protein therapies industry has a lot of interests outside of the U.S. So what I wanted to follow up on is um, kind of also not only the in international education piece, but kind of the predictions piece. So uh, there's been a prediction that uh, the agencies going forward will look more at international education, uh, that this will be a priority. I think we know from Megan Delrahim's background that's probably right. Uh, and you can predict some of the things that will be of interest, that, um, you know, there will be uh, an urge to kind of uh, convey to foreign enforcers that the uh, consumer welfare standard is the way to go as opposed to other uh, kind of philosophies, and that there'll be a focus on maybe, uh, again, looking at Macon Delrahim's background, uh, a lot of focus on the competition value of intellectual property as opposed to intellectual property being conceived mostly as a negative. With that back background in place, what do you, the panelists, see as kind of the top two or three points that you would want to emphasize as far as international education is concerned? Anyone want to pick one? I can pick. I can pick one. I don't think that the emphasis on um, economic welfare standards as opposed to non-economic goals will be new. I, I think a lot of credit to uh, both of the heads of the prior administrations, the Obama administration, who were consistent with that um, and vocal about it. I don't think that's much of a change on the IP front. I think there's significant change. I think um, perhaps the most important message. Uh, overseas is that, and, and this is a basic point in antitrust, it's, it's in our, the, the old 95 IP guidelines that in terms of methodological framework we don't treat IP and real property differently. We have a set of tools we use. That doesn't mean there aren't fact differences in the markets, but there's not a special set of antitrust rules for IP, you know, as much as there is a special set of antitrust rules for widgets, that we have the same framework all the time. That is a message that I think um, we'll hear more of out of the current administration. Did, did you uh, want to jump in with, with? Yeah, I want to jump in and say that uh, an important issue, I think, is so many countries do include non-economic or so-called public interest aspects that I think a major challenge is how to integrate those into antitrust analysis in ways that make economic sense. Uh, and that's an article that uh, Harry First and Eleanor Fox wrote about, um, but I haven't seen uh, a whole lot else on it. I think it's an important issue for the world in the future. Did you want to really you quickly? Could? I would say I would I would actually point back to the sort of market definition issue I was talking about before, which is fu really a function <laughs> of, of the role of economics. But I think it's um, um, I think that it would be this isn't a prediction, this is more what would be incredibly important is, um, is inculcating a, a, an understanding that, that you know, effectively manipulating market definition in order to, to make your cases is a, is a really bad idea. Um, that's not something that you can really, you know, at some level, you, as, as Josh was saying, you, what you really need are the right judges. Um, but, in, but in some countries, that's, that's less important and actually having the, 
the enforcers understand this and internalize this, uh, especially in high tech, sort of fast evolving markets where where products do not product market definition is you know yesterday's product market doesn't exist today and competitors are competing across perceived product market lines. I think that's extraordinarily important. The the great American philosopher uh, Yogi Berra uh, once said of a young pitcher. He's going to be a great pitcher it, once he gets his curveball straightened out. Um, I, I would like to, th to thank the panel for trying to help us get straightened out on antitrust and thank the Federal Society for putting on this program. Thank you. Thank you.